Well, welcome everybody to uh, Constitution Day and to our Constitution Day lecture. My name is Matt Auer. I'm the Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, as some of you may know, tomorrow is the 235th anniversary of the signing of the U.S. Constitution. The celebration of the U.S. Constitution and the American founding goes back to 1940 when Americans observed I Am an American Day and later Citizenship, citizenship Day. So it's kind of interesting to think back to uh, the national mood in 1940 when this moment of national pride and reflection was first established and then to sort of think about our contemporary situation. So Constitution Day was recognized as a federal holiday in 2004 when Senator Robert Byrd presented a bill designating September 17th as the day for citizens to remember and honor the signing of the U.S. Constitution. Today's event would not have been made possible without the generous support of several organizations, both on and off campus. Among the sponsors are the School of Public and International Affairs. Another sponsor is the American Founding Group, which is a faculty and student-led discussion group in the Department of Political, Political Science at SPIA, and that's led by Professor Keith Doherty, who is here in the first row. It considers topics in political science, political theory, history, law, and economics, among others. I want to thank uh, our other sponsors, including the Jack Miller Center, the UGA School of Law, the UGA Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts for their generous support for this event and for helping us honor and celebrate the U.S. Constitution. I'd like to thank the Provost's Office as well for including today's lecture in the Provost's Seminar Series on Academic Excellence. Thank you also to our student ambassadors for their help today from SPIA, Lauren Ledbetter and Wendy Finch for their logistical support. Valerie Glenn from the library for leading Constitution on the Quad just prior to this program. And Jan Levinson, um, uh, Jan Levinson Hebbard uh, with the Hargett Rear Books and Manuscript Library for providing the display of historical documents that are in the back and the, that are interesting. Please have a look at those. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Sanford Levinson holds the W. St. John Garwood and W. St. John Garwood Jr. Centennial Chair in Law at the University of Texas Law School. Professor Levinson is a celebrated legal scholar known for his writings on constitutional law. He is author of approximately 400 articles, book reviews and commentaries in professional and popular journals, and a regular contributor to the popular blog Balkanization. He's also written six books and edited or co-edited nine others, including a leading constitutional law casebook. Several book titles in his Au revoir signal to the reader that the pages therein are not meant to glorify or romanticize the U.S. Constitution. Consider the 2006 monograph, Our, Undemo Our Undemocratic Constitution, Where the Constitution Goes Wrong. Another title, Fault Lines in the Constitution, The Framers, their fights and the flaws that affect us today. Also framed America's 51 constitutions and the crisis of governance. There's a graphic novel version of Fault Lines in the Constitution co-authored by Cynthia and Sanford Levinson and artist Ali Schwed. How cool is that? Professor Levinson received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Law and Court Section of the American Political Science Association in 2010. It's a pleasure to be with him today. Please welcome Professor Levinson. Well, what I'm doing is pressing my iPhone to chime at about 42 minutes, because otherwise what I'm afraid, given my no knowledge of my own propensities, is that I'm capable of going on forever. And I want to leave some time for discussion. Um, let me begin by expressing my deepest gratitude and pleasure 
at being here in Athens. I'm honored to have been asked to speak to you and delighted as well to have this occasion for uh, returning to a place where I actually, I think, came about 48 years ago, but more to the point where there are several, uh, I have to say increasingly, I use the phrase, both literally and metaphorically old friends <laughs> with whom I am very eager to spend some time. And people could not have been more hospitable in the day that I've been here. So I'm very, very grateful. <laughs> Other aspects of today's event, though, as suggested by the introduction, <laughs> are more complicated and generate a significant degree of ambivalence. First, one has to acknowledge that this event isn't entirely voluntary on the part of the University of Georgia or any other of the universities across the country that are holding similar events because the Congress of the United States has required as a condition of getting federal funding that there be events like this on Constitution Day. Um, if this were a different sort of event, I could easily take the entire time talking about the vagaries of the so-called unconstitutional conditions doctrine and when it is that Congress can place conditions or when they can't on the receipt of federal funds. I will simply tell you that the Supreme Court has not provided anything close to a truly coherent doctrine that allows you to say with confidence when Congress can do this. There are a series of cases, but that is different from a coherent doctrine. But in any event, for a variety of perhaps understandable reasons, no university that I'm familiar with has chosen to sue and to claim that Congress can't require events like this. So I'm a very grateful, even if ambivalent, beneficiary of this congressional act. Now, what Senator Byrd, who always kept a copy of the Constitution in his coat pocket, said is that it was very important to maintain, quote, the continued vitality of the Constitution and that this depends, quote, on the efforts of our generation and of future generations to keep the visions of the framers alive. Each and every one of us, unquote, must be committed to learning, understanding, and thus preserving the, quote, governing principles that are set forth so clearly and powerfully in the text of our remarkable Constitution, unquote. So for me, there are two problems. One of them, which again could take up a great deal of time, is whether or not there are clear principles of the framers that we can identify. And even more so, and I suppose this is the second problem, whether anybody could seriously believe that they are clearly and powerfully set out in the text of the Constitution. I will confess that I'm one of those law professors, and I think I'm fairly typical of most academic law professors who teach constitutional law in focusing much more, at least in teaching, on those parts of the Constitution that I have come to call an invitation to conversation, the Constitution of Conversation. What this means in fact, is that there are no clear principles of the meaning of equal protection of the laws, or the meaning of freedom of speech, or the meaning of free exercise. All the Constitution does is to invite us to have an endless and candidly often acrimonious argument about what these terms mean. But reading the Constitution will not get you very far in deciding what those terms mean. This is in contrast, incidentally, to 
the other parts of the Constitution that I'm now in many ways more interested in that I call the Constitution of Settlement. That is, those are the parts of the Constitution that really do have quite clear meaning. And I just offer two of them very quickly. One of them is the principle of equal representation in the Senate, whereby Wyoming, with 550,000 people, gets the same two senators as California with 40 million people. That's very, very clear. I think it is like James Madison, incidentally. I think it is an evil of our system. What Madison said is that was a lesser evil. The greater evil would have been no constitution at all, and I'll be talking about that at some length later. But that doesn't negate the fact that the Constitution, that the Senate then, and even more so today, I'm quite willing to argue, is an evil. But it's not unconstitutional. You know, here I'm willing to say with Senator Byrd, take out my copy of the Constitution and just point and say, what part of two do you not understand? Similarly, even before the last inauguration month of 2021, I had written quite a few years ago that I thought that the delay we take in inaugurating new presidents is really stupid and on occasion dangerous. Um, I think this was true between 1860 and 1861. It was true between 1932 and 1933. And it didn't help us out any in 2008, 2009. But again, there's nothing to argue about what the Constitution means what part of the 20th Amendment, in this particular case, do you not understand? Um, but that generally is not the central focus of these remarks today. As was indicated in the introduction, I am not a fan of the US Constitution. This does not mean that I engage in founder bashing or am not willing to say what I actually believe is that they did the best job they thought they were capable of doing to resolve the really terrible political problems presented in 1787. My irritation or sometimes anger, as it were, is not directed against the founders. It's directed at us for not emulating what is truly best in the founders or the framers, which was their audacity, their willingness to describe the existing political system, that is the one under the first constitution, which is never taught, the Artist Confederation, to describe that as imbecilic and to say forthrightly, and especially in Federalist number 40, uh, I lament the fact that the Federalist Papers are now generally not taught or discussed except for a few of what I call greatest hits. And I think that one of those greatest hits ought to be, but is not, Federalist 40 where James Madison explains why it was altogether proper, necessary and proper, as it were, for the Constitutional Convention to ignore, first of all, the limited mandate given them by Congress to revise the Art of Confederation rather than to tear it up. But even more serious was that they simply chose to ignore Article 13 of the Articles of Confederation, which required unanimous consent of every one of the state legislatures of the existing 13 states in order to amend the Constitution. This is why Rhode Island didn't bother to send anybody to Philadelphia. Rhode Island properly feared what today we call a runaway convention. And they thought that Article 13 protected them because after all, that's what constitutions are supposed to do. Well, it didn't, because the people in Philadelphia, I would argue, by and large, correctly believed that the existing system was imbecilic and did, in fact, 
have to be transformed radically, whatever Congress might have thought it was doing and whatever Article 13 said. So from one perspective, the most important article in the 1787 Constitution is Article 7, which says this Constitution comes into being when it's ratified by nine states and by the conventions of, not state, of nine states. So they did an end run around the legislatures, and nine is very different from 13. There would be no Constitution if it weren't for that. So I admire the willingness of the framers to use very candid and brutal language, like imbecilic, to describe the system they were operating on and to do what they thought necessary to change the system. That's why I don't bash the framers. It is we ourselves who, for whatever set of reasons, have become so infatuated by the Constitution, which of course Senator Byrd was promoting, that we regard it as the equivalent of a sacred text, that it cannot be changed. And indeed, it has very rarely been changed. Since the so-called Bill of Rights in 1791, there have been a grand total of 17 additional amendments. Um, Looking around, I think it is in the lifetime of only relatively few of us that there has been any truly significant amendment to the Constitution. And actually, for most of you in this room, you cannot remember when constitutional amendment was seriously on the table because it really goes back to the Equal Rights Amendment, which of course failed in the early 1970s. Um, that, I think, is a huge mistake and I think violates some of the central teachings of the framers, including what is set out in the Declaration of Independence, quote, whenever any form of government becomes destructive, of the proper ends of government, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new governments, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall see most likely to affect their safety and happiness. I certainly do not recommend quixotic or frequent altering and abolishing, but I do think it is important to remember that aspect of the founding generation, just as it is crucial to remember and take seriously the argument in Federalist Number 1, which happened to, be, to have been written by Alexander Hamilton. But I think if you didn't know that, you might well believe wrongly that it was written by Thomas Jefferson. Because what Federalist Number 1 says is that the great challenge of facing the American people is to prove that we, the people, can engage in reflection and choice about how we are to be governed. And this is truly new in human history and really the great contribution. The contribution is not this specific constitution, which after all, could and will inevitably be time-bound, a creation of its own time, its own sense of possibility. But our genuine inspiration to the world is the ability to engage in reflection and choice. Well, that, I think, is the problem, that at the national level, we seem either unwilling or unable to engage in serious reflection and choice about the national constitution. This is not true <laughs> with regard to American state constitutions. My teaching and writing interests increasingly are in comparative constitutional law. When most people use that term, 
they're referring to a whole bunch of foreign constitutions, which are in fact very interesting and worth studying. But I also think it is a huge, huge mistake, which you find at literally our finest law schools, to believe ultimately that there's only one constitution in the United States. That is the United States Constitution. So as was pointed out in the introduction, one of my books is called Framed, and then the subtitle is America's 51 Constitution. <laughs> and they're really interesting. Georgia, for example, has had 10 constitutions since 1777. That may, puts them in second place the, um, after Louisiana, which started out 35 years later, but has had 11 constitutions. The typical American state has had three constitutions. There are a few states like Massachusetts that still purport to be governed by its original 1780 constitution, or New Hampshire purports to be governed by its constitution of 1783. But in fact, their New Hampshire constitution has been amended 146 times. And this is altogether typical of state constitutions. A political scientist Robinson Hayward Burns has noted, quote, all state constitutions impose lower bars to amendment, passage, and ratification. Of the 11,633 amendments proposed to the 50 standing state constitutions, 7,695 have been ratified. Think about that for a moment. A lot of them undoubtedly are trivial. A lot of them you might think are stupid. Some of them you might think are evil. But you also, if we actually took the time to read them, you might say, you know, this actually represents reflection and choice. Why would we think that the New York Constitution drafted in 1846 would necessarily be the one we want governing New York in 1972, say, or 1948. And guess what? New York has had five constitutions. Um, I don't know the specific history of Georgia's 10 experiences with drafting new constitutions, but I assume that some of them were the result of reformers we might actually admire. The one drafted at the turn of the 20th century was undoubtedly drafted by white supremacists who wanted, as happened throughout the South, to exclude African Americans from the political process. But that's not true even of all the Southern constitutions, let alone constitutions around the country. And the point I want to make is that nobody, nobody I'm familiar with at least, particularly venerates their state constitution. In fact, one of the things to be lamented is that an appalling number of people, including lawyers, don't even really realize there are state constitutions. So if you're litigating a, quote, constitutional law case, the immediate thing you do is to read the First Amendment or to read something else in the national constitution. Well, I won't go through the circumstances, but I had an academic fantasy come true that a case that started out in the Princeton traffic court with a member of a radical, crazy political party was arrested for trespass. And in behalf of the ACLU, the case ended up at the US Supreme Court. And I was delighted to get the opportunity. But in fact, it was decided by the New Jersey Supreme Court based on the New Jersey state constitution. And actually, I was teaching at Princeton at the time. I told the people at Princeton, we were going to win our case because of the New Jersey state constitution. Forget the US constitution. They simply didn't take it seriously. 
And so obviously I was extremely pleased when we won our case based not on the US Constitution, but on the New Jersey Constitution. And this is a common example very often if you take state constitution seriously. So what I want people to do ideally is to address even the possibility that we should engage in reflection and choice about the adequacy of the 1787 Constitution that indeed has been amended extremely rarely since 1791. And very, very few of the amendments have touched on the structural aspects that now most compel me in terms of leading to my rather doer belief that the Constitution in its own way is a clear and present danger to our national survival. It is not because of anything in the Bill of Rights. It is not because of anything in the 14th Amendment. It is because, let me confess, the US Senate, um, even Inauguration Day, our inability to fire presidents in whom we have lost confidence. It is clear beyond doubt that the impeachment clause does not work and one can argue that it cannot work in part because it's been captured by lawyers who get into endless arguments about what counts as a high crime and misdemeanor rather than being treated as in any parliamentary system as a political question where you simply ask the parliament, do you have confidence in this person to exercise the powers of the presidency? Um, so these are some of the questions that I wish would be discussed. It is not the case that I myself have clear and unequivocal answers to the questions that are posed by these. I don't. What, perhaps this reflects my being an academic, what I desperately want is a national conversation that is not taking place about what in the Constitution is in fact worth cherishing and what in the Constitution in 2022 might in fact be problematic unto being dangerous. Now I will say that one of the ways I spent 2020 and 2021 was being kind of the de facto chair of a group brought together by Michael Tomaski, who is the editor of this journal called Democracy, and he's now also at the same time the editor of The New Republic. And what Michael asked me to do was to bring together a group of, and let me be very frank, liberal or progressive people, most of us for better or worse being law professors, but not everybody, there were some political scientists and an historian, and talk about what might be a good constitution for the 21st century. I will point out that the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia under Jeff Rosen also commissioned groups of libertarians, conservatives, and progressives to draft new constitutions to see what sort of ideas might be put on the table. The National Constitution Center projects had very few people. From the, from the beginning, they had three or four people. Our group was usually between 25 and 35 people. Thank God for Zoom. Without Zoom, it never would have worked. And we met from one perspective incessantly from roughly Thanksgiving in 2020 until appropriately or not April Fool's Day on 2021, talking about different issues and the arguments we were having with one another. This is not the Levinson Constitution in part because I lost out on a number of things that I really wish had been there. And so even this group of quite ideologically compatible people, it turns out, did not agree on everything. And there were quite significant arguments. 
and people who won and lost. I won a few, but I also lost several. So when I was asked by Professor Doherty to come speak and you know, to give a title, the first thing that came to mind in terms of what I might want to talk about is what I learned from being a virtual founder myself. That is to say, here we were, a group of people, taking very, very seriously the obligation to engage in reflection and choice. So what did I find out <laughs> from that? Before I turn to specifics, let me read off some quotations. The first quotation is from President, former President Barack Obama in 2010, after the Democrats, I think he used the word thumped in the midterms, uh, now almost 12 years ago, where the Democrats lost the House. And what he'd said in his first news conference afterward was, quote, the United States is a big, diverse country, and people have a lot of complicated positions. It means that in order to get stuff done, we're going to compromise. The country was founded on compromise. I couldn't go through the front door at this country's founding. And if we were really thinking about ideal positions, we wouldn't have a union, unquote. This was a constant concern of Obama's. He repeated it to the graduating class at Harvard in 2016. He also told the graduating class at Howard that same year the following, quote, we remember Dr. King's soaring oratory, the power of his letter from a Birmingham jail, the marches he led, but he also sat down with President Johnson in the Oval Office to try and get the Civil Rights Bill and a Voting Rights Act passed. And those two seminal bills were not perfect, just like the Emancipation Proclamation was a war document as much as it was some clarion call for freedom. Those mileposts of our progress were not perfect. They did not make up for centuries of slavery or Jim Crow or eliminate racism or provide for 40 acres and a mule, but they made things happen. And you know what? I will take better every time. I am always telling my staff, better is good because you consolidate your gains and then you move on to the next fight from a stronger position, unquote. President Obama could have quoted lots of other people, including Benjamin Franklin at the Philadelphia Convention on June 30th, 1787. But of course, most of us don't really identify Martin Luther King as a great compromiser. He's not Henry Clay, who makes his reputation as being able to fabricate compromises. Um, he did call on us to love our adversaries, but that's very different from a spirit of compromise. In fact, of course, Martin Luther King was named after the man who notably said, here I stand, I can do no other. Submission to what he, that is Martin Luther, considered an illegitimate papacy was simply no longer po possible. So this is the other side, where our history includes those who are not trimmers, those who did stand for principle, draw red lines, however you want to describe it. So one other quote by somebody I had never heard of before, I suppose most of you haven't heard of. His name is Thomas Klingenstein. He's chair of the Claremont Institute, and the Claremont Institute has become quite notable recently for being the leading intellectual center of what can be called the intellectual 
Trumpian right with regard to a diagnosis of our situation and what needs to be done about it. So what Klingenstein said, quote, if you're actually in a war, even if it's a cold war, you behave differently. You're less inclined to compromise. You're more aggressive. In war, you don't negotiate until you win, unquote. It is certainly true that we don't associate Winston Churchill with the virtues of compromise. If we had more time together, especially since this is sponsored in part by the School of International Relations, we could talk about the war in Ukraine and how that war will come to an end and whether compromise should and will play a role in it. But let me return to President Obama's initial comment. The country was founded on compromise. I couldn't go through the front door at this country's founding. And if we were really thinking about ideal positions, we wouldn't have a union, unquote. So how should we interpret this? He's alluding, obviously, to the fact that the Constitution was founded on a compromise with slavery. The ancestors of his wife were enslaved. It's not true with Obama's own ancestors, because his mother was white and his father was African. That's not true, obviously, of Michelle Obama. So is President Obama, in effect, endorsing the compromise with slavery? Is he truly a dedicated patriot, and I use that term advisedly, for whom achievement of the Union takes precedence over any compromises that were in fact necessary to achieve it? Just as the dreadful compromise with regard to the United States Senate was necessary in order to get the Constitution, that's why James Madison ultimately and very reluctantly supported it, so were the compromises with slavery necessary to get the Union. So contrast the President's implicit message with that of Ralph Waldo Emerson, denouncing the various compromises with slavery, particularly in the America of the 50s, including the Fugitive Slave Law, but that goes back to 1793 and Article 4 of the Constitution in 1787. <laughs> Emerson describes the accommodations with slavery as a, quote, bribe, namely the magnificent prosperity, unquote, that union would presumably bring to the white inhabitants of the new union. For him, though, quote, it was a fatal blunder. They should have refused it at the risk of making no union, unquote. One obviously can find similar denunciations of the compromise over slavery from, among others, Frederick Douglass and John Brown. After all, we read the Gospel of Mark, or some people read the Gospel of Mark, quote, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Of what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So this is the problem faced not only by the general issue of compromise as it might come up in Philosophy 101, but the very practical questions as they came up in 1787, or for that matter, as they come up in 2022, if we are really to engage in reflection and choice, and quite frankly, if we move the universe of those engaging in reflection and choice from a small self-selected group, like the group that drafted what I call the Tomaski Project, and move to the American people at large, where if one does want a new constitutional convention, which I do, and if one does want a considerably reformed United States Constitution, which I do, I would inevitably have to try to persuade people who disagree with me quite vigorously on a number of important issues and decide where I'm willing to compromise, 
and where, and where they would be willing to compromise and where one would draw lines and see the convention just collapse, as it almost did in 1787 over the issues of slavery and even more so the Senate. The Israeli philosopher Avishai Margalit distinguishes in his own book on compromise between what he calls acceptable, even if sometimes anguishing, compromises and what he calls rotten compromises. Anguishing compromises involve the reluctant concession that the end justifies the means, and the means are not beyond the pale. So he discusses at great length, for example, the alliance with Stalin against Hitler, and says that that alliance was justified. And there's an interesting debate about that, because certainly one does not wish at this stage in our history to romanticize Stalinist Soviet Union. But I and most other people are still willing to say that the alliance with Stalin, and we never would have won the war without Russia, um, was worth it. But then he also talks about rotten compromises, which involve the subjection and treatment basically as subhumans of wide numbers of people who really have no say in their treatment. Uh, he talks about the Alta Conference in this context, but needless to say, he also talks about American slavery. And he says that American slavery is a rotten compromise. And therefore, I think it's fair to say that for Marguerite, as for uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, better no constitution, better no union, than subjection to that particular compromise. Let me say that as one of the virtual founders in the Tomaski Project, we were never faced with the issue of rotten compromise because, frankly, we were all within a certain kind of political bubble. Um, all of us, quite frankly, support reproductive choice over what has come to be called pro-life. So there were you know, a few little debates, but there was no grand debate. There were some you know, other more vigorous debates, say about the US Senate or some other issues, but none of us viewed these as calling for rotten compromises. If we ever had the National Constitutional Convention that I very, very much continue to wish we would have, would it in fact be possible to achieve a genuine compromise on the issue of abortion, which is the most visible issue before the public today? I am extremely critical of Justice Alito's seeming assumption in the Dobbs case that the resolution of our national debate about abortion will be state by state decision making. I refer to this as the federal consensus. That is a term used in the 19th century to refer to the decision that each state should be allowed to decide what it wished to do with regard to enslaving people. So if Georgia and my home state of North Carolina want to continue enslaving people, that's just fine. According to Abraham Lincoln, just fine is a little bit of an exaggeration because Lincoln did, after all, think slavery was immoral. But in his first inaugural, Lincoln went out of his way to support the federal consensus, to assure the slave states that he was not a threat to slavery in any state where it existed. Civil war is all about extension of slavery in the territories. It is not about recognizing slavery in Georgia, Virginia, North Carolina. That compromise kept the Union together for about 70 years, until it didn't. And then we killed 750,000 people 
And at the, I don't want to say the conclusion of the war, because a yet different a lecture could be given on if and when that war ever really concluded. But in any event, the formal conclusion for many people, and one has to remember that Andrew Johnson, who's usually vilified, was a very warm supporter of the 13th Amendment. Because for Johnson, the war was all about two principles. A, no secession, and B, slavery is over. The war was not about justice for African Americans, which Andrew Johnson had no real interest in. You didn't have to be in favor of justice for African Americans in order to be anti-slavery. And as I say, Johnson is exhibit A. But we did abolish slavery as a formal legal proposition, but it was only at the end of a war that killed 750,000 people. So can we imagine today mechanisms by which the abortion controversy, or you can fill in other blanks as well, affirmative action, right to bear arms. Uh, God knows there are a number, religious freedom, there are a number of controversies, but I don't think that any of them comes close to matching the intensity of the abortion controversy. How will that be resolved? So I'm coming to the end of my remarks, I think, before the chimes ring. And of course, it's traditional to wind up, especially at occasions like this, with happy endings. The solution is return to the principles of the good old Constitution. That's not my view. The solution is I have it here in my hand a constitution that all of you should accept, and that would resolve it. That's not really my view either. That, as I've mentioned to a number of people, including during my visit here, in my sunset years, I defined myself more as a political scientist than as a lawyer. And one of the things that means is that I don't think that law will resolve the debate about abortion. Law kind of invites a spirit of no compromise. You rest and you pound the table about what your legal rights are. And very, very often I applaud people. One of the people I'm just so happy to see is George Daly, who originally was from Charlotte, North Carolina. I clerked for a federal judge in Charlotte. George was the civil liberties lawyer. Uh, that, that's the chime, so wind up. The civil liberties lawyer in Charlotte when I was clerking there. And I always agreed, with no exceptions, with the positions he was taking. And they should have been uncompromising positions. But you really can't run any political system if everybody is uncompromising. Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt published a book a couple of years ago that got a lot of attention called How Democracies Die. Very powerful book. What they basically argued is that you can maintain a political order or a constitutional order only if there is a spirit of what they called forbearance. Well, another term for forbearance is a willingness to compromise. It is a willingness to say, look, I have a constitutional right to say hateful things. And my view of the First Amendment is that for better or worse, you do have a constitutional right to say hateful things, inspired in part by George's own courage as a civil rights lawyer. In Austin, Texas, I actually defended the Ku Klux Klan when they wanted to march down Congress Avenue because they just did have a right to march down Austin Central Avenue if other groups could march. It was unwarranted state censorship to tell the Klan that they couldn't march. But they shouldn't have marched. They're a dreadful group. And we'd be better off without the Klan and without 
their articulation of their views. And we'd be better off without hate speech, and we'd be better off without a lot of people relying on a sense of, but I have this right, and I'm going to push it for all it's worth. So the answer, if there is an answer, is that we can only expect people to be good sports when they lose significant political controversies. If the stakes aren't, to use a phrase that one sees very often these days, viewed as existential or absolutely basic. And I'm willing to be a good sport. I'm willing to say, you know, there'll be other elections, and I expect the losers, if I win, I expect the losers to be good sports. But there are some issues, and slavery turned out to be one of them, where people were no longer willing to be good sports. And it's not clear what it would mean to be a good sport on the abortion issue, but I'm very confident lawyers will not play a very helpful role in deciding what the ultimate parameters should be. No constitution can genuinely foreclose the necessity to choose. And the criteria by which we make our own choices will require going outside the Constitution to consult our own basic moral and political principles. So for better or for worse, that is my message on Constitution Day 2022. I doubt that it would have satisfied Senator Byrd, but it is complying with his wish that we commemorate the Constitution every year on or about this date. And I hope I've at least complied with that aspect of the law. So I think there is time for... Oh, please. Yeah. And let me emphasize, they need not necessarily be questions. Comments are also perfectly appropriate. Um, you, you had mentioned a Supreme Court decision that did reify a state constitution in the decision. Are there occasions over the years where you have observed a decision in either a, a state court or a federal court where you sort of just hit your head and said, oh, why didn't the ju justices in this case pay attention to what the, s the state constitution has to say? Well, I mean, there are some areas where I think it's just, you know, kind of more or less true that we leave states to make their own decisions on how to organize themselves. Um, if I can make a political science -y point here, one of the things that drives me crazy is the argument that you often hear that American constitutionalism requires the unitary executive. For purposes of argument, let's stipulate something that I do not in fact necessarily subscribe to, that the United States Constitution correctly understood requires the so-called unitary executive which places huge powers in the hands of the president. If you look at the 50 American constitutions, you discover that roughly three of them, led by New Jersey, come close to adopting the unitary executive. Far more typical are Georgia and Texas. Um, easiest example, in both of our states, there are vigorous elections going on even as we speak for both governor and attorney general. It is not unknown in our states or other states for the governor and the attorney general to be of opposite political parties. It is not unknown for the governor and lieutenant governor to come from different parties in a number of states. So one of the things that's, so two points. One is that this decision is up to the states to decide that there is no constitutional principle of the unitary executive 
that requires Texas or any other state to emulate the national model. And that's also true, I think, for various sundry social policies. Um, you know, Justice Alito professes to say, well, the Constitution is completely silent on abortion, so states will be free to be pro-reproductive choice or pro-life, and the Constitution says nothing one way or the other. My own view is that that's not politically viable because both sides want a single national solution, just as both sides on the slavery dispute wanted a single national solution by the mid-1860s. And we did get it with the 13th Amendment. Uh, so the question is whether Congress has the power to pass a single national law on abortion. I think the answer is yes. John Yoo actually has an essay in today's Washington Post saying that Congress doesn't have that power. I think it's an interesting argument, but I think that most lawyers would disagree with him that Congress quite clearly has that power. But, I mean, there are lots of times in which the Supreme Court properly says this is a matter for state decision, even including some like capital punishment. I think it's interesting to compare capital punishment with abortion. Both of them involve death and whether the state, in the case of capital punishment, can inflict death or with abortion, whether if you're, depending on what side you're on, whether a state can permit the infliction of death. Capital punishment, the federal consensus seems to be working. And it may be because even those people who care very deeply about capital punishment, especially who are abolitionists, either are not or cannot organize a significant national movement that says we need to have a single national solution. The Supreme Court tried this in the early 1970s. I supported what they were doing, but they gave up very quickly, in part because of new appointments to the court. And so what we've ended up with is a mishmash of incoherent decisions as to exactly when the state can impose capital punishment. But the bottom line is that Texas can kill people and other states have chosen not to. And you know, the American people seem fine with that. So it's a really interesting question, you know, what federalism means. And my own view is that one has a federal system if and only if there are groups of people distributed geographically who kind of don't like and fundamentally mistrust one another with regard to certain fundamental sorts of views. And so they enter into alliances, will accept a common defense policy, will accept a common economic policy, but we want to be free to have our own policies on liquor. Um, you, not only you could write a book, there have been many books written on liquor in the Constitution, gambling, prostitution, et cetera. Um, and you know, it's always been a touchy situation as to when you want to honor the diversity that federalism brings with it. And when you say, no, I'm not gonna honor diversity if it means enslavement. At that point, you become a universalist, or at the very least, a nationalist who says that it's just not congruent with American values to allow enslavement, which I assume all of us agree with today, but that wasn't even Abraham Lincoln's view in 1861. He didn't like it, but he thought it was congruent to you know, honor George's right to maintain it. I don't know if that helps or not. First, thank you so much for joining us today and your gracious talk. Um, one of the topics you mentioned that I thought was particularly fascinating was the discussion of state constitutions. 
um, and their role in determining decisions. And I know this is particularly relevant um, for Kansas because Kansas's uh, vote on abortion mm -hmm. on the amendment was due to the fact that by their own constitution they said no further restrictions could be more than 20, somewhere early yeah. 20 weeks. So um, Justice or Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the Sixth Circuit, I understand, is particularly interested in this idea of state constitutions as experiments mm -hmm. for the national constitution. And I was curious, do you see the improvements in the US constitution coming from an amalgamation of the best ideas from the states? Or do you think that the national constitution must be a top-down imposed on the state That's constitution? That's a really, really interesting question. And that's another one that, if we had time, it could t easily take the next hour to talk about, because a colleague of mine at UT and I are literally writing an article right now on the little laboratories of experimentation metaphor, which is so pervasive. And we argue that it really makes almost no sense because it encourage you, encourages you to think that states are like scientists in which they impersonally conduct experiments motivated by the ethic of science, going wherever the evidence takes you, you know, fearless of political consequences, whereas states are completely political institutions. And even if states had the money and the resources to conduct really sophisticated tests of social policy, they're not going to do it if the testers are coming up with politically unpalatable conclusions. I mean, think of the debate on guns. So that Congress and its majesty has forbidden the CDC down the road in Atlanta for a number of years even to conduct any research on gun policy because I think they're afraid of what the research might show with regard to the relationship between at least certain kinds of regulation. On the other hand, it's a very embarrassing truth that there is no solid research linking any of the so-called gun control policies with significant declines in gun violence. So both sides can get frustrated, but the one thing we know is that guns are an extraordinarily volatile issue and that nobody is willing to say, okay, let's turn this over to a group of impersonal experts and we'll, expect, we'll accept whatever they come up with. So abortion, I think abortion is different from gun policy in that nobody defends gun violence. The arguments usually take the form, I mean, John Lott are, has argued for years, for example, that if you want to prevent mass murders, the easiest way to do it is to arm everybody because the good guy with a gun will take out the guy with the AK-47. I personally have a hard time agreeing with that argument, but he bases it on empirical research. And to defeat it, you presumably have to come up with empirical research. Whereas on the abortion issue, it's a rock bottom argument about values, as is true of slavery. Now, you know, there were arguments about, well, what's the best way to get rid of slavery? Lincoln thought the best way was compensated emancipation that would not come to an end until 1900. That was his compromise solution as late as 1863. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation is a very, very radical switch. But even there, as Obama alluded to, the Emancipation Proclamation applied only to those enslaved persons outside of the control of the national government in the so-called Confederate states. Nobody was emancipated in Missouri, Kentucky, um, Delaware, or Maryland, or for that matter, in Norfolk, Virginia, 
or in New Orleans, both of which were firmly controlled by federal forces again. Um, but, you know, I don't know, I mean, would anybody dare to suggest, let's stick with a strong reproductive choice policy until 2050, at which time we will simply ban all abortions, partly in reliance that we would use the 28 years both to educate people on what's wrong with abortion, or we'd come up with certain techniques that would make abortion just unnecessary. You know, similarly go the other way. We will ban abortions now until 2050 when reproductive choice will become the law of the land. I don't see that. You know, I don't, the debate seems to be much, much more fundamental at this point. The irony, the paradox, is that the Supreme Court, in a series of largely incoherent decisions and compromises, ended up with a solution that most Americans accepted, that nobody was really happy with it. If you were strongly pro-life, you certainly wouldn't accept the Casey regime. But if you're strongly pro-reproductive choice, you also don't accept the Casey regime and some of the subsequent cases. But if you did, you know, Gallup polling, you found, what, 65, 70% of the public said, you know, I'm willing to live what, with what we've got. I'd rather have abortion blocked at 15 weeks than go up to 24 weeks, but you know, I can live with 15 weeks. And then there are some people for reproductive choice who would say, you know, I really don't like tightening the time, but most European countries, in fact, have 15 weeks as the limit on abortion, and they seem to have resolved it. Abortion is simply not an issue in any of the Western European countries. Um, and so you can say the Supreme Court stumbled into a solution that was completely inelegant, but was kind of working. Now, thanks to the Supreme Court, it's been returned to quote the political process, unquote. And I genuinely don't see what the solution will be, um, especially in our political process. <clears throat> you know, which involves things like the U.S. Senate um, and the like. But it may be, quite frankly, that no constitutional process can really handle issues like abortion or slavery, that it really does require, you know, at best forbearance, at worst war, in order to bring those kinds of controversies to an end. You know, other issues I can be more optimistic about. You know, I could say that a lot of our problems really can be traced to the Senate and the inability of legislation to get through the Senate. And you know, I think part of the frustration of the country, whatever side you're on, you know, right now, Congress, I think, has an approval rating usually of somewhere in the high teens or low 20s. And what that means is that wherever you are on the political spectrum, it is very unlikely that you say, you know, the country is faced with some real challenges, and I have faith that Congress will step up to the challenges, or that they could step up to the challenges. Again, wherever you are on the ideological spectrum, whereas I think the lesson of the last 10 years especially wherever you are in the ideological spectrum, is that Congress is gonna step up. That Republicans won the election in 2016, at least, you know, if one emphasizes the Electoral College. They ran on a platform of getting rid of Obamacare, and they couldn't do it, you know, because of John McCain, but that's the way the Senate works. Democrats cannot pass their program, 
except insofar as it gets the approval of Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. Um, and you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens after the November elections as to whether anything significant will come out of Congress, whoever wins. I mean, if the Republicans take over Congress, then all they will do is pass legislation that Joe Biden will veto. It is not that they will be able to pass legislation that will become part of the law of the land. Unless, of course, they make a grand deal with Biden, but to put it mildly, the current Republican Party is not in the business of making deals with Joe Biden. Because if you make a deal with a sitting president who wants to run for re-election, you help that president win. So, I mean, I hearken back to Teddy Kennedy during the George W. Bush administration, where Bush got two major pieces of domestic legislation, no child left behind, and a drug pricing bill. He got those bills through only because Teddy Kennedy went along and compromised. Uh, both of them gave things up and you know, therefore ultimately agreed on what each could support. And my view is that Teddy Kennedy reelected George Bush in 2004, that Bush could run as a uniter, not a divider, who was able to get things done. And what Mitch McConnell has learned is that why in the world would you want to do that if you're a dedicated Republican who wants to capture the presidency? So, you know, that is the current reality for many, many issues, but I think it's an especially problematic issue for um, abortion. I mean, my view is that the National Republican Party in private, the last thing in the world they wanted was Roe versus Wade to be overruled. That Roe was a great case to run against, but they really did not want to be given the political responsibility for deciding what abortion policy should be. But thanks to Justice Alito, it's now, you know, they're the dogs who have caught the bus. And all you have to do is read the newspapers to realize that they really have no idea what to do in terms of a united party. And it may very well cost them the midterms. Um, I don't think that was Justice Alito's desire or even his expectation that that may simply speak to how politically naive he was or simply how dedicated he was to what he viewed as the one true interpretation of the Constitution, that his duty as a justice was to impose that one true interpretation regardless of the consequences. I don't know Samuel Alito, I have no idea of how he thinks. But whatever he thought he was doing, he certainly transformed the 2022 political season. Um, I think we've come to the end. I mean, I, mean, I could stay here much longer, but you, that would be subject to a suit for false imprisonment. So you know, let, let me thank all of you for coming here today.